dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, dear followers of the Euroco platform, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic honor for me uh, to um, welcome today in our interview uh, Professor Hashish Kamat. Uh, welcome, Professor Kamat. Um, he's a, a director at the MD Anderson Cancer Center and he's a president of the ICG and the IBCN um, um, Association. Uh, please, uh, Professor Kamat, you uh, gave a great talk today on uh, BCG and on the future perspective in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and high-grade uh, diseases. Could you please just uh, give us a short um, summary of what you discuss, and then afterwards we will uh, highlight some, some of the points. Absolutely. And, and first off, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the invitation. Um, the topic essentially is you know, what's new and what's happening in high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And that's a vast topic right now. I mean, there's so much happening in the field. Um, a few things that I focused on in the talk are essentially, is BCG relevant today? If BCG is relevant, how can we improve upon it? If it's not relevant, in other words, if it doesn't work for a particular patient, what are some of the options for the patient that are currently available? And of course, once we reach the non-BCG spaces, the BCG unresponsive disease, first of all, how do you define that? And secondly, when you define it, how do you then improve upon treatment for the patient? So I covered a whole range of topics and tried to do that in a short time. Great. And um, for, for our, our followers, what is your opinion about the place of BCG actually? Does BCG still have the main role or is it already getting a step back? Yeah, no, that's that's a very, very important question because, you know, if you look at the data that's been published over the last two decades, it appears that BCG's response rates have improved over time. And that's partly because we as urologists and urologic oncologists have gotten better with being able to better select patients and also have understood that in order for BCG to work properly, you have to give it a certain specific way. If you look at most contemporary series, the response rates to BCG are much higher than than the older data, and progression rates are really in the teens to sometimes single digits. So the most recent publication, for example, from our center, from the Anderson Cancer Center, showed that even in high-risk bladder cancer patients, most patients do not progress once they get adequate BCG, and at two years, the progression-free survival is greater than 85%. Great. And uh, you were talking about high-grade uh, and high-risk patients. Um, I really like your, your slides regarding PTA high-grade and uh, the message that you, you try to, to, to give to the audience regarding uh, PTA high-grade and the, their management. Can you explain us how you, you see this, this disease uh, in the, among, the, among the different um, specialties in, in non-muscle invasive? Bladder cancer? Yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, the risk classification depends upon the grade and the stage of the tumor. And the EAU risk classification has traditionally included high grade TA tumors in the high risk category. More recently in 2021, and of course this year and last year, some of these smaller TA high grade tumors end up falling in the intermediate risk category. And that's reasonable when it comes to risk classification by the EAU. But if you look at practical considerations, these patients patients behave very similar to any high-risk, high-grade patient, which is why we recommend that for a clinical management at least, these patients be considered high-risk and the treatment be tailored appropriately. Great. Um, and finally, I have two two main questions. Uh, do you think we have to redefine, although you already worked a lot, uh, for the BCG and responsiveness definition? Should it, should it be refined according to what you said and about the PTA high grade and so on? And I will uh, ask you another question for uh, the audience. In your opinion, where should we look at for the next coming months, I mean, in the next year, about uh, what is the most new thing that we should expect from the, from the clinical trials that are unrolling now? Yeah, um, very good points, and I'll try to summarize it. So the definition of BCG unresponsive disease was uh, initiated more to help companies, investigators, and regulatory bodies such as the FDA design clinical trials and allow drugs to get approved on a single arm basis. So if a patient meets the BCG unresponsive criteria, he or she is allowed today, even in 2023, to enroll in a single arm study 
and then that drug can be approved for registration. But in the practical term, because there's a BCG shortage across the globe, not every patient actually gets all the BCG that he or she needs to be considered BCG unresponsive, and then that group of patients is called BCG exposed. The main difference is that when those patients are enrolled in a clinical study, uh, a single arm study is not enough. You need to have some control arm, and that's the main nuance that we have to keep in mind with that patient cohort. Now, as far as what to look out for in the next two, three months or what's happening right now, I think one of the biggest advances that we've come across, and it's partly because there's not enough BCG, so groups have tried to come up with alternative therapies, is the combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel. That appears to have a very high salvage rate in BCG unresponsive patients. And also in BCG naive patients, when you don't have BCG and it's used, the response rates are almost as good as BCG itself. The other thing is there are two drugs that are currently approved in the United States for BCG unresponsive patients. One is pembrolizumab and the other one is natafaragine. Pembrolizumab is currently clinically available. Natafaragine is not yet clinically available. And those are the two things that are approved. Then two more therapies that are very exciting and we expect that they'll get approved soon. One is the IL-15 super agonist, the NAI from Immunity Bio. Data look exciting. Of course, it's not been approved yet, but it looks really good. And the other one is the combination of CG0070, which is a oncolytic uh, virus, in combination with pembrolizumab. So a lot of exciting things happening, but I would focus on those four at the yeah. moment. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kamat, for uh, being with us today uh, at the Euronco platform. And um, thank you for all your time and congratulations for your talk of today. My pleasure. Thank you.